Um, yes, I am Sarah Bird. I'm from Chester Zoo. Sue sends her apologies. I think um, numbers of you know her and she would have liked to be here, but other things have come up this weekend. My job at Chester Zoo is biodiversity officer, which means that I'm involved in getting the zoo, um, finding roles in local conservation for Chester Zoo. And I started off as a volunteer at Sue's monitoring of Cheshire Dormice, and now I'm lucky I'm paid to be working on that because it is now one of the local conservation projects that Chester Zoo is doing. Just an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to mention a bit about volunteers, but I think some of the topics I'm going to cover um, have already been mentioned, so apologies for that. I'm going to introduce you a little bit to our project, talk about who volunteers with us and why they do it. I'm going to run through the process on our sites of how we run our surveys. I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of, uh, importance of teams and partnership building, and then a couple of light-hearted do's and don'ts for volunteers. Okay, so looking at the importance of volunteers in conservation, again, I think some of this has already been covered. Conservation organisations generally rely an awful lot on volunteers, and when I talked to Sue about it last week, she said Cheshire Wildlife Trust get three times as much work done through volunteers as they could if they just relied on their staff. So it's a, um, a thank you to all of those of you here and to all the volunteers out there, because we couldn't do this sort of thing without you, particularly wildlife surveying is um, time consuming, hard work and is reliant on volunteers. We are, um, it is really vital that you're out there. Also in Cheshire and in North Wales where I'm working, volunteers are widely distributed as are dormouse sites, so it's useful to have volunteers locally that can help with a site near to them. I have to say I am really jealous of Kent's situation and Hazel's, all those dormice, I wish. <laughs> Okay, so the Northwest North Dormouse Partnership, um, as I say, I went out surveying with Sue in early 2000s, probably 2004 was the first time that the idea of building a partnership came up. Um, we were looking then at two sites, one the Cheshire reintroduction site where Dormice were reintroduced in 1996 and 1997, and a natural population in North Wales near Ruthin which was discovered in the early 90s by um, people monitoring bird boxes who find, found dormice in those bird boxes. And it struck me that actually using the skills of the zoo, just a zoo, um, we could enhance the, um, the value of the monitoring, particularly by individually marking our dormice so that we could learn about the ecology of the animals um, and then feedback to informing woodland management. Individual marking here is done with microchips and because I've got the zoo's vet team behind me we actually do it under, under anaesthetic. So that adds um, a complication to the monitoring because we have to take our animals from the dormouse boxes down to where the vet's situated on the site and then put them back. So it makes our monitoring uh, slightly more complicated. These are the aims of the project. Um, and we set up, we started in 2005 and the idea is to collect um, 10 years of data, so we're almost there. I'm hopeful that we will actually um, reassess sometime next year and decide that we want to continue doing this because once you've got a large data set like this, I think it's worthwhile continuing um, and building on that data. But of course, we need to have realistic and achievable research um, aims in there to be able to do it. This is a fairly familiar map. Thank you, PTES. Um, I guess you're going to see various <laughs> versions of this. This is the 2008 version. Just to give you an idea of where we're monitoring, we're looking at the um, north edge of the Dormouse Range in the UK. This is the Cheshire site, the reintroduction site, and this is the site near Ruthin that we're monitoring. I have to um, big up the Ruthin site because though we don't have many Dormice in North Wales, this is often one of the biggest um, or one of the sites that records the largest number of dormice in the UK. And actually, that 43 gram dormice that we saw on um, slides this morning was one of ours. <laughs> so, why are volunteers so important to our project? Well, this is um, the North Wales site. It's quite a large site, so you're talking about perhaps a mile and a half long. We have about 220 boxes on our on each of our two sites, and we only manage to get out and survey four times a year. But if my maths is right, that is 1,760 boxes per year. So it is a big commitment. 
Um, and the individual marking, as I say, takes time. And we need highly trained, highly skilled volunteers to help with that. And of course, using volunteers is good for promoting our conservation messages, for engaging new people. Um, and actually, on these, in this partnership, we've never had to advertise for volunteers because we've had enough connections. And once word has got around, um, we've always been very um, well endowed, should we say, with volunteers. Of course, it's not just the monitoring. There's also the winter box maintenance that our volunteers help with. We usually have about 15 to 20 volunteers per session, but don't panic, we divide those into groups. So for doing this site, we will have three groups working along transects here in the morning, and then in the afternoon, they will work back along the transects this way. So it's three groups with five or six people in each group. Who are our volunteers? I think we have talked a little bit about this before, and it's very much the same in Cheshire. They're contacts from our partner organizations, from wildlife trusts, their contacts from the zoo, from Natural Resources Wales, from Natural England, from the local councils who are partners in the project. And they're, they're also friends and colleagues of uh, people that are already there. They're local groups, the Cheshire Mammal Group, Snowdonia Mammal Group, they're local naturalists, they're members at Wildlife Trusts or Chester Zoo, people like that. We have our consultants as well. We have students coming from universities, particularly um, Chester Uni now and Bangor. Um, and Manchester universities and of course then there's just the local people that love nature. <coughs> why do people volunteer? Well I think the picture here basically says it all don't you? That's why so many of us volunteer. It's not rocket science but there are other reasons as well. People want to take part in useful conservation. They want to walk towards, towards their license. Some of them want a day out in the woods. We've seen the social aspect. There are lots of reasons why people get out and do it. So what do we do when we go and monitor our dormice? Well, it all starts before we even get there. I'm assuming that using Lorna's tips, we've got our group of volunteers, we've got our email list or our phone list. So we send out loads of information to people before they actually come out with us. Things, obvious things like where to meet up, how to get there, contact phone numbers, guidance on the kit that you're going to need, the fact that you're going to need boots, you're going to need waterproof, you will need your lunch, and also risk assessments and notes on the terrain because um, our woodlands are not easy to get into. They're often very steeply sloping, they're muddy, they're wet. It's going to be you know, a bit of a struggle through some of these woods to get to all those boxes. And we need to prepare our volunteers as far as we can so that they know what to expect and uh, they don't um, end up having a problem on the day. This is a, a copy of the risk assessment done through the Wildlife Trust scheme. Um, that we send out to all volunteers before the day. <laughs> okay, so on the day, assuming that everybody knew where to meet up, and this is the lay-by in, in Ruthin in North Wales where we meet up, we do a register to make sure that we've got everybody that said they were coming, and if there's somebody there that hasn't turned up, we will um, phone them, see if anybody's got a message, try and find out where they're not there. <coughs> we don't wait around very long for people. If they're not there within 10 minutes of the meeting time, I'm afraid they've missed it. Then there's a biosecurity check that we go through. We look at everybody's boots and we spray everybody with propeller. You can see it here. Um, originally, this was for um, Phytophthora on Larch, and we were required to do it by the Forestry Commission. Now, of course, we've got ash dieback as well, so it's even more important, particularly when the volunteers that we've got are often people that are out on other wildlife sites moving around in Cheshire and in North Wales. So this is a key part of, of the pre preparation for going out to our woodlands and it's happening here as you can see outside of the wood before we've even gone there. We talk about the weather and the plan if it were to start raining very hard. We give advice again on the team uh, and communication and the terrain. We allocate people to teams. I talked about teams of five or six people with uh, a team leader and I bash on, people always laugh at me, I'm always bashing on about the importance of the data, the fact that it's a nice day out in the woods, but the ultimate aim is to get good data back for the research project. People get a bit sick of me saying that. So before we go into the woods, each group is given their dormouse kit bag. Um, familiar things, I suspect, to most of you. We have our big plastic bags. We have our cloth handling bags and our hankies, which are all site-specific, again, for biodiversity reasons. 
we have our weighing scales, we've got hand cleaner and gloves because we're out all day. People will be stopping partway through the session to eat their lunch, so we want to make sure that they're not going to pick up anything nasty. Gloves primarily are for emptying out nasty bits and pieces in dormouse boxes. We have a whistle because some of the sites are big and teams are um, have been known to lose volunteers in the woods, so if you have a whistle and a team signal, hopefully you can link back up with your volunteers. You might laugh, but it has happened. And pencils, of course, um, and there's a key thing missing there. Anybody volunteer what it is that's not there in that box? <coughs> it's the recording sheets, yes, of course. And you might groan, we don't do this simply either. We go to um, extreme lengths here. We have recording sheets you can see at the top there. We have lots of instructions on how to fill in the recording sheets. That's me again, I'm afraid, being a bit um, anally retentive, should we say. Um, we have a route map here with all our boxes marked so that you can work along the transect that you're monitoring easily. We know where the vet's going to be located at any time from the map. And we have copies of permits and licenses in that um, clipboard as well. We want to make it as easy as possible for our volunteers to record. So on our recording sheet, we have two recording sheets actually. This is the box contents recording sheet. And what we actually put on it um, is the contents of the box at the previous session. Here, and I'll just show you that. So here it is, because I store the data in an access database, this is quite easy to do. The recording sheet is printed out as a report. And in this column here, the contents last time we were out. So this was um, September this year. No, it wasn't, this was October this year, and that's what was in the boxes in September. It's really important that people understand when they're entering, should we say, dormouse territory. Um, and it's also really valuable for those wasps and things like that, that we can, we can see that you're approaching a box that you need to be cautious about. We also provide um, photos of sexing to guide um, gender determination, which has proved really, really valuable. And then we have a separate sheet which is where the individual data about the dormice goes. Because as you can see on here, there's a one column, and it's quite, it would be difficult to fit all the information in there. I actually noticed when I was doing these slides that this one is filled in wrong. <laughs> what I want there is two dormice, not all this information. This is box 882, and if you look down here, box 882 has two records for dormice running along there. So even though they got it wrong, they did it OK. <laughs> that was clear. So when you've been doing this a few years, you do get a bit obsessed, I have to say. But, uh, <laughs> people laugh. It's fine. I don't mind. OK. So during the survey, we've got our team, team leaders, which are licensed. And they are responsible for demonstrating best practice for survey. And I encourage team leaders to do this every session, whether or not your um, volunteers have seen it before, because it's good to refresh the memory. And it, it sinks in more if you're seeing it regularly. They ensure that everybody gets a turn at each of the tasks because we want to keep our volunteers interested and happy. It's got to be a positive experience for them. And if you give somebody the recording sheets for the whole day, and I'm going on at them all the time, they get a bit fed up about it. So we make sure that everybody has a go at checking boxes, at handling animals, at doing recording, scanning for microchips, doing sexing, taking the dormice down to the vet for marking, and then returning the animals for box to boxes. Obviously, the leader whose license is observing anybody who wants their license. And of course, we're making sure that our, our teams are OK. And then after the survey, back in my office. Um, no, not after the survey, back in the office. Back at, <laughs> sorry, it's getting to me here. Back at, back at the cars, should we say, when we finished. We checked that we haven't lost anybody. It did happen once. We sent out a search party, and we find them again using our whistles. You know, I'm sure you can visualize it. We collect up our kit bags and our marking records. We remove our hankies and handling bags. Those are washed between site visits so that there's no chance of transferring anything. And we talk with people who are doing their licenses and we sign off their sheets. And I think I'm right in saying that we were one of the groups that sort of pioneered this sort of recording sheet. It's good to see it's working in Kent as well. And I think we're nationally picking that up now, aren't we, aren't we for training? <coughs> so uh, we, we started doing that. And then, of course, most importantly, 
we say thank you to our volunteers because they've had a um, an enjoyable but probably quite um, strenuous day out in the field. They're wet and they're muddy, they're probably hungry, they could do with a bit of that cake um, and we're just about to send them off. So we thank them profusely before they leave. And then this is me back in the back in the zoo on the following day. I check through the recording sheets because there will always be issues. As you saw there, there was a bit of an issue. I contact the team leaders if I have a problem interpreting what's on the sheets. And my biggest bugbear is empty nest. I'm sure you all know the empty nest saga, do you? With it, uh, is an empty nest a bird's nest? Is it a, a wood mouse nest? Is it a dormouse nest? Empty. They call me the empty girl, actually, because. Uh, I go on about it so so much. Occasionally we get animals that you are recorded on the, the nest box sheet and don't occur on the individual dormouse data sheet and that often is because there's been an escape. So I check up on those, I make sure that there's a tally and at that point of course I would know how many animals that we've seen um, during, the, during the session. We share any good photographs um, with the email group, with the volunteers and where we can we do social media and blog about what we've seen. So this was um, out in October, one of my biodiversity trainees talking about the session that she'd been on, and that's promoted to all our volunteers. Okay, just, just a little bit on team and partnership and how important that is um, to build commitment from your volunteers and the fact that actually doing that will improve the quality of your data if everybody's feeling motivated and part of the project. So we produce an annual report, fairly simply, Sue is responsible for this, that just sort of summarises what we've seen in the year and our feelings and any particular experiences that, that volunteers had during the year. Um, it's a good sort of team building exercise. We encourage feedback always from all our volunteers. We circulate copies of any publications and uh, when we've been out to one of the international conferences that's particularly important. We do occasionally have social events so we do our bit with cake um, and barbecues and things like that. Probably once a year we try and do that. And we do our ecology training days, this was the most recent one in, in North Wales in October, um, to back up the training um, with the ecology and the classroom learning on dormice. So my light-hearted do's and don'ts, do let us know if you can't make it, but please don't phone after midnight. I know Sue has, has her phone by her bed and it buzzes quite a lot and she gets really fed up of it, people saying I'm not coming out in the morning. Volunteers, if you're unsure, ask about anything. Even though we send out all this information and try and help our volunteers through, I know there are still times when people need to ask. So it's the volunteer needs to feel they can ask and the, the leaders or the people running the session need to be prepared to tell and repeat um, information. Do explain what you want and why. That's why we bash on about the research and the data because it's not just about the National Monitoring Programme for us, it's about our own research. People don't read everything you tell them, so you do have to go through the risk assessment when you get on site, and you do have to tell them again about monitoring procedures and best practice. But if you do support them and help them, it will benefit you and the records and the team spirit between you. Don't expect them to perform miracles, but I know volunteers quite often do. So this is um, us. This is a, a sort of example of our, one of our sessions with a few licensed people, Sue, myself, um, Charlotte here, Richard, and then the rest of the volunteers that will be helping us. So it's a big thanks to all our volunteers and of course, those are the partners that support us as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. Some very good lessons there about how to recruit uh, manage and retain volunteers in a, a rather smaller group than in the southeast. So, a contrasting approach, somewhat. Uh, time for a couple of questions. Ian. You set a maximum number of volunteers you take out, we've learnt, I think, from experience that, that groups of more than six in a team are too much. And, and the individual volunteer doesn't get the value then. So we usually limit it to, to six per team, which is 18-ish per day. Um, we have another couple that can help the vet. So 20, 21 is our, our maximum session for the day. 
referred six per team somewhere else as well. Yes, so. yes, I was reassured by that. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? If not, very well, there's Hazel. Yes. Right. Having seen your pictures, I'm not sure that there are any. I suspect it's easier to get an animal out of a plastic bag, isn't it? Because they can't hold on so easily. And you dispose of them, I guess, at the end of the day, so you're getting around the biosecurity thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess there's a bit of bit concern in that because we may be moving our animals to the vet and back, that they're in them for a longer time, so it's perhaps more comfortable for them if they're in for 15 minutes or something that it's a cloth bag. Yes, they can breathe better. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 